as co-organizers to this conference. The cooperation between the University of Calgary and the Bundeswehr Center of Military History and Social Science has been well established for years. It has also and always been an intensive cooperation between our institution and Professor Holger Herwig. If my memory serves me right, the first contact with the Bundeswehr Center of Military History and Social Science took place in 1969 when Holger Herwig, a young doctoral candidate then, spent several months as a visiting researcher at the military division of the Federal Archives in Freiburg. That was 48 years ago. As we learn out of this example, this connection has been established for so long. Not everyone in this room may be familiar with the task of our institution. Allow me, therefore, to very briefly introduce the Bundeswehr Center of Military History and Social Science. Our organization was founded as Military History Research Institute in 1958 as an agency subordinate to the Federal Ministry of Defense, we have engaged in basic historical research ever since. We contribute to the historical education of the German Armed Forces and prepare expert reports on military history. Our institute also exercises administrative control over the Bundeswehr Museum of Military History in Dresden and the Bundeswehr Air Force Museum in Berlin. After German reunification, the Bundeswehr Center of Military History and the Bundeswehr Center of Social Science was relocated from Freiburg and Munich to Potsdam in 1994. In 2013, our institution merged with the Bundeswehr Institute of Social Science. Today, 62 scientists work in Potsdam. Around two-thirds of them are historians. Approximately half of these historians are civilian employees, the other half are officers. <clears throat> All of the officers are trained historians who either already hold a doctorate degree or are currently going through the doctorate examination procedure. I feel it is important to emphasize these facts because we attach particular importance to our cooperation with the university science. The focus of our historical work is on German military history of the 20th and the 21st centuries. World War I, which brings us to the topic of this conference, has always been an important core area of our work. This has been even more the case since its centenary. Since 2014, we have held two international conferences on the global dimension of war, and on the topic of battles of material. The members of our staff have taken part in dozens of national and international conferences. We have released various publications, including the German version of Holger Herwig's book, Battle of the Marne. We also participated in excursions, for example, to the Tannenberg battlefield in Poland, to the Alpine front in Slovenia, to Verdun, and to the Somme as part of the Great British Army Staff Ride in 2016. So you can see World War I is keeping us busy and there is no end in sight. Those who travel to the Western Front will inevitably also be confronted with the participation of Canada in World War I. Usually, the characteristic maple leaf can be found on the graves of the Commonwealth War Grave Commission. This raises the question of how the German soldiers perceived their former enemies and how the Canadian operations should be assessed from a German point of view. There is a certain irony in the fact that, in the military language of the time, the Germans who were organized in a federal state usually did not differentiate between Englishmen Scotsmen, Welshmen, Irishmen, or Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, and Canadians. They were usually just referred to as Englishmen. I do not want to analyze the resentments that may have existed between the troops of the different Commonwealth countries. I'm sure you are much better at that than I am. 
In any event, looking to the other side of the Vimy Ridge, Bavarian soldiers and officers would probably not have been particularly impressed if they had been called Prussians. <laughs> According to the constitution of the German Empire, the German army was a contingent army which consisted of elements from the constituent states of Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony, and Württemberg. The organization, equipment, and training of the troops had already been standardized to a great extent before the war. Also, since the beginning of the war, the field army was under the supreme command of Emperor William II. Still, individual regional ties remained strong in the heads and hearts of the soldiers. There continued to be widespread mistrust and suspicion towards the dominance of the most powerful federal state that was Prussia. In the course of the war, such reservations against the brethren in the north often turned into pure hatred. Particularly, the Bavarian soldiers and officers increasingly felt that the Prussians were merely using them as cannon fodder. In early September 1917, a Bavarian division commander tellingly wrote into his diary, quote, the entire world war is not as difficult to bear as the type of Prussian leadership. Well, after the war, I won't settle down in Prussia anyhow, end of quote. However, such resentments cannot disguise the fact that, on the whole, the German troops closed ranks and joined forces in their fight against the external enemy. The war in defense of an alleged external attack on our home country, propagated by the emperor, the Reich government, and the military leaders at the beginning of the war, was a clamp which, for a long time, unified the German conscript army in this war. The readiness of the soldiers to defend their own country was in parts based on ideologized enemy stereotypes, which, very soon after the beginning of the war, also spread among German soldiers of all contingents. Great Britain, with its dominions, was particularly targeted in this context. The enemy stereotypes were panned primarily by the bourgeois elite, from famous German intellectuals such as Thomas Mann, Max Liebermann, or Friedrich Meinecke, advertised war was the fight of German culture against Western civilization and its alleged decadence. The declaration of war by Great Britain on 4th August 1914 triggered a particularly negative response. From then on, the English, who before the war had been admired as congeners and cousins, were now perceived by many Germans as unfaithful traitors. According to the linguistic logic of this time, this applied to all Commonwealth nations, which later on also included the Canadians. Germany no longer regarded its hereditary enemy, France, as its main opponent, but the competing English naval and economic power, the perfidious Albion, the adversion against Great Britain culminated in veritable hate speeches. One such example that gained notoriety was the Hassgesang gegen England, Song of Hate Against England, by poet Ernst Lissauer. Quotation. He is known to all of you. He is known to you all. He crouches behind the dark, gray flood, full of envy, of rage, of craft, of gall, cut off by waves that are thicker than blood, hate of 70 millions choking down. We love as one, we hate as one, we have one foe and one alone, England. End of quote. Interestingly, this song of hate should no longer be used later on in World War II. As Lissauer was of Jew Jewish faith, his words were replaced by, quote, Denn wir fahren gegen England, for we are sailing against England. A poem written by Hermann Lönz in the same year of 1914, which was quite popular in Germany at that time. With this attitude, the German military leadership confirmed the unyielding fight against its English main enemy. Chief of the General Staff Erich von Falkenhayn spoke of Germany's most dangerous rival, 
who could not be expected to show mercy. His successor, Paul von Hindenburg, argued in a similar fashion when he proclaimed, using historical insinuation, quote, in 1866, there was a duel between two cavaliers. In 1870-71, we were forced to punish an ill-mannered street boy. But today, we must crush a scoundrel, end of quote. Already after the beginning of the war in 1914, it was common for German soldiers on the Western Front to greet each other by saying, quote, God strafe England, may God punish England. The answer was, quote, er strafe es, may he punish it, end of quote. Nonetheless, there were clear limits to enemy stereotypes and hatred among the German troops. In this case, generalizations are hardly suitable for describing complex phenomena, as it's so often the case in history. Many soldiers' songs characterize their opponent by means of humor, rather than with aggression. The soldiers did not consider the soldier on the other side who suffered the same, their enemy, but rather politicians and high-ranking officers. Around Christmas in 1914, the first ceasefires occurred in the Western Front, and even scenes of fraternization between German, British, and French soldiers. On 28th of December 1914, a soldier of the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment, which incidentally also included an infantryman by the name of Adolf Hitler, wrote to his parents, quote, It sounds hardly credible what I now report, but it is poor truth. The sun had only just started rising when the British appeared and waved to us, and our people waved back to them. Gradually they came, completely out of the trenches. Our people ignited a Christmas tree they had brought, put it on the wall, and with bells ringing. Everyone was moving out of the trenches, and no one would ever had even thought about shooting. Between the trenches, the hatred and bitter opponents meet around the Christmas tree and sing Christmas carols. All my life, I will never forgot, forget this night. We saw that human beings carry on living, even when they are reduced to killing and butchery. Christmas 1914 will remain unforgettable for me." End of quote. Similar scenes of a brief truce described by the British sociologist Tony Asworth as the life and let life system occurred along the Vimy Ridge in early March 1917. The commander of the 261st Prussian Reserve Infantry Regiment reported about a meeting initiated by the Germans with Canadian officers in no man's land. The objective was to recover wounded and fallen comrades. Quote, we officers stood together with the Canadian ones, all of us with our pistols on the belt. I had finally offered the Canadian officers cigarettes, which they all lit. We separated at two o'clock and even shook hands. Soon after we separated, a British officer of the division staff appeared at our trench. He said that the division commander wished to express his sincere thanks. He would return the favor if the opportunity arose. I must say that the Canadians, with their staunch military posture and demeanor, made an exquisite impression. They could almost have belonged to the 261st. <laughs> End of quote. These words out of the mouth of a Prussian officer showed the highest consideration towards the Canadian opponent. Since their first encounter with German troops in the Second Battle of Ypres in spring 1915, the Canadians on the Western Front had gained a reputation as a widely respected and extremely successful elite force. Again, quote, the Canadians were all excellent soldiers and very familiar with the methods of the Western theater of war regarding attack and defense. They had already proved themselves in the Second Battle of Ypres in April 1915, fought valiantly at Festubert, Givenchy, and Saint-Éloi, 
fought in the Somme battle in which they distinguished themselves by conquering Courcelette, end of quote. Those were the retrospective words of a German veteran of the Battle of Vimy Ridge when describing the Battle of Vimy Ridge, General Hermann von Kuhl, chief of the general staff of Heeresgruppe Kronprinz Ruprecht, Army Group Ruprecht of Bavaria, also spoke with high recognition of the Canadian Corps, quote, which was one of the opponent's best troops, end of quote. Similar assessments of the Canadians were also made by other German generals. Until the end of the war, German troops time and again suffered major setbacks inflicted by the Canadian Corps under the command of General Arthur Curry. Take, for example, the conquest of Passchendaele in November 1917, and not least the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August 1918, a devastating German defeat, which General Erich Ludendorff fittingly described as, quote, the black day of the German army in the history of the war, end of quote. In view of the bloody losses which also the Canadian troops suffered in these fierce battles, I am today far from engaging in any glorification, let alone military pathos. For the soldiers on both sides of the front, war was always a bitter experience of suffering and death, of, quote, hunger, thirst, and shit, as German historian Gerd Krummeich fittingly described it recently. Nevertheless, the presence of respect and recognition towards the opponent shows us even today that, in spite of the day-to-day -day violence in a horrendous war, decency must not be completely replaced by blind barbarization and pure hatred. Canada was one of many enemies facing the German Reich from 1914 to 1918. Still, I feel there are a number of other points that could be significant for us German historians even today. Which aspects of Canada are worth taking a closer look at? What makes Canada different in our eyes? Firstly, the Canadian commitment shows us time and again that from the onset, World War I was a truly global conflict. The decision of the United States to enter the war, by the way, exactly 100 years ago this month, may have been a crucial turning point in this conflict. However, Americans were present in European theaters of war at a much earlier time. Secondly, the possibilities and limitations of coalition warfare are important issues, back then and again today. Of course, France, Great Britain, and the US had to coordinate their war against the Central Powers. In this regard, it is interesting for us Germans to observe that Canada, as dominion within the British Empire, also had to organize a kind of internal coalition. And Canadian decision makers were eager to ensure that their political and military contribution was approximately acknowledged. The Vimy operation is an important case in point. Thirdly, there is the issue of conscription. As you know to us Germans, conscription was for a long time part of our military self-conception and even the fundamental principle of German governance. Until 1945, the general public in arms was a topos in the military discourse. As you know, things are different today. Against this historical and political backdrop, it is interesting for Germans to read how Canada entered the war with an army of volunteers. What manpower the Canadian Expeditionary Force was able to attain in that way and how long and fierce this issue was debated. Fourthly, the affirmative manner in which the memory of the Great War seems to be upheld in Canada is always striking to the German observer. For Canada, the war of 1914 to 1918 was a national identification process. For Germany, the opposite was the case. For us, World War I was not a great war. It was rather a defeat that was to enable a much greater disaster. Therefore, in Germany, the memory of World War I will always be overshadowed by the memory of World War II. 
these two ways of remembering the war in Canada and in Germany somehow cannot be concealed at all. This is not a problem for us academics today, but it is an interesting intellectual challenge. The program of this conference shows me that we will be discussing some of these controversial issues in the course of this conference. I am looking forward to the presentation and debates which are going to follow. Also in the name of the German delegation, I would like to express my sincere thanks for the excellent preparation and the friendly reception here in Calgary. I hope that we will be able to keep up our connection and I wish us all an inspiring conference. Thank you very much for your attention.